We thank you for taking the time to be with us at C3. We hope you enjoy today's message. You guys ready to go? All right. Why don't you open with me to Exodus chapter 17. Is that the right chapter? That is the right chapter. All of you who have the note page are like, yep, that's right. And you who, who aren't are like, can I get one of those? Um, yeah, so we are in, in Exodus chapter 17. We are, this is part, uh, part 20, I believe, in Exodus. Um, fun series, a lot of good stuff in here. If you want to get caught up, all the, all the videos uh, are pulled in on the website, so just go there and, and you can check. They're all there, kind of sorted by uh, when they were and, and, and what they're about, so check them out. Um, they're really great. It's really good to get caught up on. Uh, before we jump into Exodus, I just kind of want to open with this. This is First Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 8 and 9. And it says, Be alert and of sober mind, because your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. That sounds nasty. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And, and I open with that because there's kind of going to be a theme opened up here, um, sort of idea of an enemy that's, that's chasing after Israel, it's chasing after, uh, and consequently, you and me. And, and so, you know, we, we know that we have an enemy, there is an enemy out there, there is, and I don't want to get like real dark, but, uh, you know, we got to be on guard. The Bible talks a lot about being alert, be of sober mind, pay attention, be watchful, um, your enemy, the devil, the accuser prowls around like a roaring lion. And when the New Testament talks about your enemy, it's talking about a couple of different things. It's talking about your flesh, your, 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 your sinful nature. You're just kind of the part of you that's like selfish by nature, you know, that part of you that's that voice inside that always wants to do the wrong thing. As much as you want to do the right thing, it, it, it always wants to pull you back and, and do, do the wrong thing. It also uh, speaks of your, your former life. Uh, you know, many of us have a life we could say our BC days, you know, before Christ, you acted, you lived, you, you, you ordered your world a certain way. And those things, you know, maybe, maybe you had some vices, maybe it was alcohol or, 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 or different things. You've got a former past life. And as much as we would like to believe in a lot of ways that that is gone forever, for many of us, that continues to nag at us throughout, throughout our life. And if you, you, you know those tendencies, you know those things, saved by grace, uh, going to heaven, part of the kingdom, following Christ, but that old nature still kind of nags at us a little bit, right? It never, never truly wholly goes away until the end. That's part of the hope of our future. And, and so when the Bible talks about an enemy, your enemy, the devil, he roars around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You know, lions don't just go after the strongest in the pack. You know, I love, I love uh, watching, Julian's starting to watch like these kind of animal documentaries and shows and stuff, you know? And, um, and, and, and you watch the lions go and they're hunting and, and whether it's a lion or a cheetah or hyena or whatever, they're never going after the strongest, healthiest, ready to go, you know, animals in the herd. They're looking for usually like babies or sick ones or the ones that they can kind of separate and pick off, right? There's always a vulnerability there uh, that, that a, ro- a lion is, is roaring after. And it's the same way, you know, it's, it's when we're vulnerable that we can find ourselves in trouble, uh, and so, so keep that in mind. We'll kind of come back to that. But let's go into Exodus. And here in chapter 17, uh, the, the, the people of Israel, they've left Egypt. They're on their way. They've crossed the Red Sea. Uh, they're kind of in the wilderness. And they're sort of, they're still kind of at the beginning of their journey through the wilderness here. Um, eventually, they're going to make it to the promised land. Um, and they're going to send some spies in. And they're going to be freaked out. And then they're going to have to wander around for 40 years. And there's a whole mess. So they're not quite there yet. So it's kind of like new wilderness territory. And all along the way, they're, they're learning about God. God's kind of revealing more of who he is to Moses. And Moses is kind of passing that on to Israel. And they're learning about how, how this God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, who they kind of heard about, uh, they're learning to trust him. They're learning to kind of, um, to what, what is he like? What is his nation like? How is he going to take care of us? And so uh, they, they get in the middle of nowhere. They're in the wilderness. There's not a lot of, of lush, beautiful terrain between Egypt and Israel. 
Um, it's, it's mostly desert. It's mostly gross. And so um, they don't have any food. So God sends manna, right? And we, had a, uh, we heard about that a couple weeks ago, something for them to eat and make. And it's just enough provision every day to get them through the day. And if they try to keep it for the next day, it spoils it. It goes bad. And, 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 and it's this, this exercise in trusting God every day. You know, and it's echoed in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day, what? Our daily bread. Not, not tomorrow's bread, not our weekly. Not, it's a day. It's a day at a time. The provision of God sometimes is only it's a day at a time. You've got grace for today. You've got, you've got grace for this moment, for right now. You know, tomorrow will have its own problems. We'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. Today is, is the day the Lord has made. And so... Um, so they get there, they get the food taken care of, and then, and then, oh, you can't just eat, you need some water, right? And so then, then last week we had the water and the rock, and, and they're, they're grumbling at Moses, and they're all mad and everything, and Moses hits the rock, and the water comes out, and they get to drink, and they're, they're all happy. And so right after that, in the same chapter, um, uh, you know, as they're, as they're learning, is the Lord among us or not? Now they've got actually a physical enemy. So God has gone through and he's met their, their physical needs. He's met their hunger needs, their thirst needs. Um, he's, he's taking care of them kind of as they go. Well, now they're going to be under attack. Now, Egypt never actually, never did battle with Egypt. They, 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 that was kind of part of the amazing miracle of it all, that they, they were able to leave as slaves of one of the most powerful empires in the ancient world. They left without, we would say, firing a single shot. They left without you know, having any battles or anything. Even when Pharaoh came after him with, their, with his chariots, um, we know that, that they didn't have to fight them off. They crossed the Red Sea and the waters come back and it takes out the army. So they've not actually had to fight a battle until now. So, um, so it's right after the water, right after that, um, and, and God feeds them, he gives them water, and now they're under attack. So we're in Exodus chapter 17, verse 8. And it says, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us some men, go pick some people who can fight, and go out and fight with Amalek. There's not a standing army, there's not, you know, you got a hundred guys, go pick the 20 best ones. No, there's, they don't have an army. They're, they're, they were slaves. They, were, they, were, they plundered Egypt, but they don't have probably a lot of weapons. If they have some weapons, they're kind of fashioned out of whatever they've got, maybe a few, you know, pitchforks and shovels and things like that. Um, and, and they don't have an army, so you go, go pick some guys who can fight and, 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 and go out and fight Amalek. And he says, uh, tomorrow, while you're fighting, I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Moses has this staff, right? This, this is kind of important. Um, and it's the same staff that when he meets, meets God at the burning bush, he says, you know, throw it down and it'll do this. It turns into a snake and it's super cool. And he picks it up by the tail and it turns back into a staff. How would you like a staff like that? That'd be so cool. My wife would freak if I had a staff like that. Um, and so then he, he takes that and that's the same staff that he does all the stuff in Pharaoh and he strikes the Nile and turns the blood and all this stuff. And it's the power of God working through this thing uh, through Moses, right? And so, so Moses' staff isn't special in and of itself, but it, it, it's, it's representative of kind of what God is always doing to, to help Israel and, and get them through. So he's going to go up on the, the top of the mountain, uh, and he's going to pray. He's going to kind of intercede to God for Israel during the battle, right? It's a good thing to have somebody like Moses up on a hill praying for you to win a battle. Like, that's, that's, a, that's something you want in your back pocket. Um, in, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, you get a little more um, detail into what happens here. It talks about Amalek. Uh, striking them from behind. So you've got this massive column of people, right? And they're, and they're transitioning. They kind of camp for a while at a place, and, they, and then they start to move. And you could just imagine, I mean, you talk about like, like a million or so people. It's, it's kind of a long line of people. And so just like a herd kind of on the Sahara, uh, you've got some stragglers in the back. You've got a few people, maybe a little slower. Well, they're not going to attack the front where the leadership is and probably the strongest men. They're going to come in the back. And so that's that's what happens, and in, in Deuteronomy tells us that, that they attack uh, the slower, more helpless Israelites. What a cheap shot. So there are some, also some introductions in this chapter. Um, we, uh, we meet this first mention of the Amalekites in Scripture. So, so who is Amalek, the Amalekites? Amalek is a grandson of Esau, and if you know that name, it's Jacob and Esau. So you have Abraham, who gets the promise that they're going to make a great nation out of you, that that lineage, then it's Isaac, and then it's Jacob. Jacob had a brother named Esau. And Jacob and Esau, this, the, from birth, like they wrestle in their mom's womb, 
right? They're like twin brothers, and, and, it's, and, and she's like, you know, <laughs> she's just got these boys just going crazy in there. Um, and, and, and there's some stuff about that. So like literally from like before they're born, these guys are at each other's you know, odds. And they come out, and, and Esau comes out, and he's all hairy, like his arm is hairy. Like, hey, and, and, and they name him, you know, because he's hairy. And then, and then Jacob comes out, and he grasps his heel. Like, can you imagine, like, a baby reaching up and grabbing another baby's heel? Like, it's just wild. And, and so they name Jacob because he grasps the heel, and he's kind of a deceiver. And, um, and, and so then they grow up a little bit, and this is the story where of, of the birthright, right? You've heard the story of the birthright. And so Jacob is... Um, He's kind of a, a homebody. He likes to stay at home. He likes to stay close to mom. He likes to kind of, some would say maybe kind of a sissy, but you know, he just kind of likes to be at home. Esau's an outdoors man. He's like, I'm going to go, I, I'm hunting, I'm out, like I'm bringing home the bacon. Like, so, um, so there's kind of this favoritism in the house always. And what happens is one day, Jacob's really conniving. Like I read the whole, pretty much the whole story of Jacob up until he, you know, gets to Joseph in Genesis this weekend. And, uh, and it's, it's amazing to me how it's like, we talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Like, they're these great, awesome dudes. And Jacob's kind of the worst. I mean, he's, he's like really deceitful. He's really conniving. He's really smart. Uh, you know, when he, like, he does this thing where he tells his father-in-law, like, he's like, I'll make a deal with you. You give me all your bad, spotted, speckled goats and sheep, right? And he's like, sure, that's a great idea. And then he goes and he finds a way for them to like, when they mate, they mate in front of a, like a branch and it makes them have speckled and spotted babies. So he like takes over the whole flock by, it's just crazy. He's like super smart, but he's super kind of just weaves his way through stuff and steals stuff and takes stuff all the time. And it's just amazing to me that who God chooses to use, right? That's kind of my point is, is, is you know, we, we, we revere these people as these great, amazing people, but they're just like you and me in a lot of ways. You know, they just kind of tend to be, you know, willing and chosen, and, and, and what God does in them is just amazing. They're just vessels, you know? So anyway, Jacob and Esau, um, Esau's out, and, and it said that he even, like, smelled, like, the outside, like, in a good way. He smelled like fresh air and pine needles, right? He's probably using the old, old spice, you know? I mean, this dude smelled <laughs> like a hunter. And, and so... Um, Jacob decided one day, he was technically younger, you know, when twins are like, I'm four minutes older than you. Yeah, so he was the younger one. And, um, and so he, he makes the soup, right? And Jacob can cook. He makes this delicious soup. Esau comes back, and he's so hungry that he's going to die, right? We've all, if you've had teenagers, if you've been a teenager, he's going to die. And so he's like, give me some soup. I'm literally dying over here. And he's like, oh, well, you know, I could just give you some soup, but, you know, how about you give me your birthright and I'll give you some soup? He's the firstborn. He's a special kind of inheritance, right? And so he's like, Esau's like, Psh, yeah, whatever. I'm about to die of hunger. What good is a birthright? So he's, sure, great. You can have it. All right, here's your soup. You know, so he eats the soup. And then so he steals his birthright. Then later in life, um, Isaac, their father, Abraham Isaac, is, is dying. He's old. He's like can't see real well. He's laying in bed and he's like, hey, bring me uh, Esau so I can pass on my blessing. And um, his, their, their mother liked Jacob. So she kind of hears this and she goes and she's like, he's like, Jacob. So Esau comes in. He's like, he's like, Esau, go out, catch me a whatever, a deer or something and bring it back and cook it. You know the way I like to eat it. Like, you know, I, I barbecued some, um, some pork belly this weekend and it was People enjoyed it, and so it's like, you know, you, you know the way you like your food, right? You know, there's like some guys in your life that are like, I like my meat a certain way, I like my meat and rare steak, you know? He's like, go out and make me the food the way I like it, and bring it back, and then I'll give you your blessing. He's like, okay. So Esau goes off to hunt, and their mom's like, Jacob, this is your chance. He can't tell the difference right now. Go in and steal the blessing. What kind of mom is it? Like, she's like, man. So these people are screwed up. So he... <laughs> He, she, he's like, well, I don't have hairy arms. <laughs> he's like, Esau has hairy arms. So she puts these like goat skins on him, all stuff, and makes them all hairy. Um, and, and he goes in and he talks to Isaac. And, and, and Isaac's not dumb. He's just like old. So he's like, you sound like Jacob, but you feel like Esau. You know, he like feels his arm. And, and so long story short, he gives, he gives Jacob the blessing. And it's this amazing, you know, 
kind of passing on of this. It's not, it's not just like, I bless you, you know, go. It's like this really amazing, profound, incredible moment, right? But it's stolen. Like, it's wild. So then, uh, then Esau comes back, and, he, and, you know, and, and uh, he's like, hey, um, I got your food for you. And he's like, who are you? I just gave the blessing. And he's like, I'm Esau. And he's like, oh, geez, who did I, you know, he's so mad. He's like, who did I, who did I bless? And he finds out that it's Jacob. And then so Jacob has to leave and he runs off. And, um, and then he ends up through Jacob continues the line of Abraham. And that's part of the blessing is that just as Abraham was blessed to have a, a lineage and a line and a, and a great nation, it goes now through Jacob, who was the firstborn. Isn't that wild? That the, like the children of Israel was like a stolen birthright. How cool is God to make that work? Like, how much grace and love and mercy is there in God that a stolen birthright becomes now the 12 tribes of Israel? And it's just wild. Okay, so then Esau, Jacob runs off, and he kind of, and then eventually they come back, and Esau lives his life. But you can imagine Esau's pretty mad. So Esau, kind of long story short, Esau has uh, a grandson. And there's a lot more to the weirdness of this story. There's like a, a Hittite woman who's like, Abraham's really cool. I've heard of his lineage. I want to get in on that. Um, but she kind of not really into God and all that. So she's like this concubine, marries into the family, and they have Amalek. Okay, so this grandson of Esau, it's this wild, like, biblical craziness. Okay, and, and Amalek is this grandson of Esau. So that's significant because this division between Jacob and Esau, you know, it, it kind of carries down for literally generations. I mean, generations of Hatfields and McCoys right here. I mean, it's like, it's a big thing. So Amalek now um, kind of lives in this area, and there are people that kind of, uh, they're kind of nomadic. They sort of survive and make their livelihood on like raiding villages and people who pass through. They're kind of in that, in that part. And so um, they're kind of like the Huns. Hey, they don't really have like a city or a, or a nation, but they, they just kind of raid people and take their stuff. And that, they, you know, rather than farm it, let's just take it. So, um, so that's, that's Amalek. And Amalek kind of becomes this major figure. Um, and, it, and, it's, and it's part of this sort of Jacob and Esau thing, but it also has a lot to do with this attack right here. Because as much as Amalek um, is, is in that lineage and kind of carries some of that probably disdain and hate and, and issue... Those aren't his issues, right? So whatever generational issues are in your family, like they don't have to be your issues. You have a chance to break that cycle through the power of the Holy Spirit and, and what God can do. And Amalek didn't do that. Amalek kind of attacks Israel here and, and, and on and on it goes. And he gets himself into a lot of trouble, um, or at least his people into a lot of trouble. And, and we'll get to that. So there's Amalek, right? The Amalekites. Um. And then the other, the other name that you've probably been waiting for to get to, the, the other one there is Joshua. Okay, so, um, so Joshua, this is the first mention of Joshua. Joshua becomes a major figure. He's, um, he becomes kind of Moses' right-hand guy. Uh, there's a whole book written. After Moses dies, um, Joshua is the one that leads the people into the promised man land. He has a book named after him in the Bible. Like, big deal guy. So this is the first mention of Joshua. Um, born in Egypt, assumingly has been doing well with Moses, for Moses to be like, hey, Joshua, go get some people, go fight. Like, this is their first battle. Joshua's the guy he chose. So, this is a significant guy, probably been faithful uh, in a lot of ways, reliable, probably decent with a pitchfork. I don't know if he ever had a sword, but, um, you know, so, so this is Joshua. Um, and, and I love this about Joshua because it's, it's not here yet, but later on, uh, several different places uh, in the rest of the Pentateuch, the rest of the kind of Moses is what Moses wrote. Um, this is that Joshua's name was, was Hosea or Hosea. And that means, uh, oh, save. It's this kind of crying out name. And, and Joshua was born in Egypt. Okay. And, and in Egypt, the, the, under the slavery was, it was all like, God save us. Can we be saved? Like, like we're in slavery. Can we get out of this? Right. Very similar to a lot of the African spirituals, um, in America, similar kind of thing. And so it's, oh, save. Well, Moses calls Joshua at some point. It's not really clear exactly when he starts calling him Joshua instead. But it says his name was Hosea, son of Nun. But Moses called him Joshua. And what, what happens is that that kind of adds sort of God's name into, oh, save. So now it's, now it's Yahweh saves. 
Now it's God save us. Now it's, you know what I mean? It's like God does the saving. So it's this kind of really beautiful, like, somebody save us, God saves us. And that becomes Joshua's name. So it's very cool. Joshua's a really cool guy. So this is his introduction. These are the Amalekites. And uh, the focus on, on, on Jehovah saves Joshua cannot be overstated, which is a kind of, it's also, it's, it, it's kind of a derivative gets to becomes the name Jesus, eventually. <laughs> kind of cool. Kind of cool. So, verse 10, Amalek attacks. Enough history. Sorry, guys. Um, it's fascinating stuff. So Joshua did as Moses told him, and he fought with Amalek, while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So Moses is on the hill, and he's got his brother Aaron, who becomes like the high priest, and then this guy Hur is also an important guy, uh, obviously, because he's right up there with the big three. And whenever Moses held up his hands, Amalek, sorry, skipped, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hands, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. While Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Surprise victory. Israel should not be beating Amalek in a fight. So there's there's a lot going on in this little thing. And so, um, you know, we'll get to kind of picking it apart. But I want to kind of keep this in the context of, of, like I said uh, in 1 Peter, that the, the enemy, the devil, roaming around like a, like a lion, looking for who to devour. Because the surprise attack from Amalek is significant as much as anything else. And so, um, the Amalekites, they attack right after Israel had experienced a great blessing. And I, and I think that's important because they had, they had just been, you know, through the man thing, they're just now dying of thirst and God miraculously grants him thirst. So, like, when you experience a great blessing in your life, you're kind of riding a little bit of a high at that point, like a spiritual or emotional high. Like, you're feeling pretty good about life, right? You're kind of, you're, you're, you're in the peak. Like, you know, you, you were wondering how to make ends meet, and check came in the mail or whatever. You, you, you did it. You know, you picked up an extra shift or an hour when you didn't think so. You were wondering when you were going to get a job, and you finally got a call. You got the job. You know, yes, awesome. You know, whatever, whatever that thing is. You had that breakthrough with your kid. You know, they finally got it. Whatever, whatever it is, you know, you're riding that kind of high moment. And this is right when Amalek attacks. Like right after this really great, great moment um, of, of blessing and of provision. And so um, Jesus tells us to watch and pray so that we don't enter into temptation. Like all throughout the New Testament, there are verses like this where it's like, watch and pray, uh, be strong, don't, don't fall asleep, like be of sober mind, like you got to pay attention, you got to be on guard all the time, you can't take a break, you can't take a day off, like you've always got to be kind of aware that that enemy is roaming around like a lion, looking for, for a chance, looking for a chance to strike, looking for a chance to kind of, kind of come get you. And so there's always the risk of attack. There's always the risk of attack. And you're most vulnerable right after a victory. A couple times in scripture where this happens. Abraham, after his victory with the four kings in Genesis 14, he's tempted to take the spoil for himself. He has this great high moment, and he's tempted to take the spoil for himself instead of giving it uh, where he was supposed to give it. Joshua, the very same Joshua we're talking about, after the battle of Jericho, they marched around seven times. I mean, we, like Jericho is this iconic biblical battle where God does what only God can do. Like they shout at walls and they come tumbling down. Like that was God. That's not Joshua, right? Then right after that, if you keep reading, Joshua goes and he becomes overconfident and he loses the next battle to the people of Ai. Like, you just watched God rip walls down by shouting at them, and now, then you go and you're overconfident, you lose a battle. So you're vulnerable right after a victory. After Elijah in 1 Kings 18 defeated the priests of Baal, he became discouraged and he was tempted to quit. Like, you just, fire came down off a mountain, consumed an altar that was soaked in water, and consumed all the false priests around it that were leading the whole nation astray, and now you lose heart <laughs> after seeing that? Vulnerable to attack right after a blessing, right? 
vulnerable to attack. Jesus, after his baptism, God comes down, the Holy Spirit, like a dove, descends on him and says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And that's when he goes in the wilderness to, to be tempted. Now, of course, he, he, he did not sin, tempted, but did not sin, which makes him the son of God, which makes him the Christ it's special. But the point is that you're vulnerable after a blessing. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says this, Therefore, let, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. If you think you stand, you better watch out. Be careful. Take heed. Pay attention. Because you might fall. You think you're standing, you might fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. See, it's kind of is to me like, you ever, you ever been like on a ladder, and it, I'll say it almost falls down, <laughs> or, you know, and it's like you're up there, and you're one minute, you're working, you're doing whatever, and then all of a sudden, it's like, <laughs> you know, and you're like, I've been, I've been on a ladder in this room plenty of times, in these ceiling tiles, and there are rafters that, you know, run this way, and I, I, I've, I'll, I'll hold the rafter, you know, just in case, and then like reach for something, but I've had, the, I have the mental image of me hanging by a rafter, <laughs> with the ladder on the ground, shouting for Rosie in the front office to come in and, like, <laughs> save me. It's never happened. But, you know, it's like that moment where you're on the ladder and you're like, I think I'm standing, <laughs> but you better take heed lest the ladder falls down and you fall down with it, right? It can happen that fast, unexpected. So pay attention to it. But God is faithful and will not let you be tempted beyond your ability or the ability of the Holy Spirit inside you to endure it. So we're under constant threat of attack, temptations, old attitudes, the former life, all of that flying at us all the time. There are bad relationships, there are toxic friendships, there are reactions and feelings that we thought we'd buried. You know, a trigger that brings up an old memory, a smell that brings you back to an old abuse. Those are always there, just kind of sneaking around, waiting to attack you like Amalek. So the question is, how are you going to fight when the battle starts? How are you going to do battle? Because Amalek attacked. And there's an option. You can just kind of, Moses could have just sent Joshua out and said, good luck, man. (laughs) Hope we win. But no, instead he decided to seek God and, and go up. And there's an assumption that Uh, Moses isn't just making the call to take his God staff and go up. There's an assumption in the text that that he had sought God, and this was kind of God said, go up on the mountain, raise your hands up. That's kind of of assumed uh, when you read this. Um, And so so the, 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 the point of that is that he goes up and he fights the battle, and he doesn't fight his battle alone. And that's key. You don't fight your battles alone. See, in verse 10, he says, Joshua did as Moses told him. He fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Now, it's interesting to me. Like, Moses kind of does a lot of this by himself. Even, even I kind of love, like, back in Egypt, when Moses is like, I can't speak very good. And can you send, and, and God's like, I'll send Aaron. He'll be the mouthpiece. And so, like, the very first time they go talk to Pharaoh, like, Aaron does the talking, you know? But then, like, I don't know if Moses just cut him out or, or if he gained some confidence or whatever, but Moses kind of starts doing all the stuff kind of after the first few encounters with Pharaoh. Like, Moses is the one who, who does kind of all the acts and starts talking to Pharaoh. It's like back and forth with Moses and Pharaoh. So Moses is, is not necessarily a lone wolf, but he's at the top for a reason. He's, he's, he's the one who kind of God kind of talks to and works with and all this stuff. And so it's interesting to me that he goes up on the hill with two other people, one of whom I don't even know if we've heard of at this point. He brings these two guys with him, and he doesn't go up by himself. And so, you know, he could have easily, I mean, raised his arms up and, and, and kind of hoped for it, but, but they were right there with him. And so he goes up, and when, whenever he held up his hand, Israel prevailed. Whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But his hands grew weary. See, no matter how well equipped you might think you are for the battle, that there is a time you're just you're gonna grow tired. It's gonna happen. And there's a question even about was Moses physically tired? 
Was he kind of like spiritually worn out? Is he praying? Is he worshiping? Could be doing all those things. I mean, uh, the text says that Moses was, was physically able. He was like really in good health, like pretty much all the way to the end, which is significantly longer than this point right here. So he's not like unwell. Um, but the point is that he grows, he grows tired. And when you grow tired, when you grow weary, you better have some people next to you to help you along, right? You better have some people there to help you get through it. And so <laughs> apparently the, the one condition is he has have his arms up. But it doesn't say anything about you can't sit down. So they get him a rock. He sits down. And, and now you've got uh, you know, Aaron and her on either side. And so you know, if you're standing up, it's like, oh, you know, sit down. And now you just hold his arms up like this. So you've got one guy on either side, you know, Moses in the middle, and he's kind of up with his, with his staff. Like, it probably looked kind of silly, but, you know, it's cool. Like, we're winning the battle. I'm getting tired. Oh, we're losing the battle. Okay. <laughs> Second wind. I could do it, you know. And, uh, and so, so he's got his friends there with him. He's got, you know, people important to him right there. And it, it, it's customary, similar to today, but it's customary for for, for Jewish people to pray with their hands up, to raise their hands when they pray. And so Moses is most likely praying, interceding, even worshiping. I mean, this is a very similar, which is, we kind of do this still, right? International sign of surrender. Some people like to, you know, so we surrender to God, right? Or, or you're opening. It's just a posture. That's all it is. It's not like it's a magical, like, if God won't, God won't touch me if I don't reach out. It's, not, it's, not, it's, it's more of a posture. It's just kind of a way that we worship. To say, I feel on my heart that I want to open myself up to God what you want to do. So, so when I want to receive something, you know, if he's going to give me something, I'm going to hold my hands out, right? And I'm going to receive that. So God, I want to you know, receive. Or, or God, I surrender to what you're doing. Just a posture. As you're praying, as you're worshiping, as you're as you're interceding. And so Moses is here posturing himself in front of God saying, saying, it's, it's you. We can't, we've got no soldiers, we've got no weapons, and even if we did, this is your fight. We can't win this without you. And he's not doing it alone. See, God's doing the fighting, and God wins the victory for us. It's God who wins the battle. It's God who wins, gets the credit. He's doing it with us and for us, but we have to play our part. We have to stand, as it said in the New Testament. So how do we do that? I mean, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Flip over there if you can. Um, it's the armor of God passage. And, you know, it's hard for somebody like me who grew up kind of in the 90s in church to think about the armor of God without picturing the, like, plastic armor set. You know, do you guys remember that? Which, you know, you, you never, I never really had access to until I was like 14. And they had one at this church. I went to, oh, you know, youth group busted into the kid's closet and you put the stuff on, none of it fits. And you're like, this was so cool when I was a kid. Now it looks so stupid. I'm like, wow. You know, but, um, but if you can, um, it's hard for me, I understand. But if you can, uh, try and hear these with fresh ears and fresh, fresh eyes. But um, so Ephesians 6 verse 10. Finally, he says, be strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power. This is the last thing he says in the letter to Ephesus. So let's you know, put some emphasis here at the end of Ephesus. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. You know what those schemes are? Those schemes are accusation. They're deceit. They're past life, past failures. The Satan, the accuser. He accuses you of not being good enough. He accuses you of being a failure. He accuses you of of not living up to what God has set for you. And God is the opposite. God says, God says, I have grace for your failures. God says, I love you no matter what. God says, come, come back, try again. Let's go. So stand up against the accuser's schemes. Verse 12, for our struggle, and this is key, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. All that really means is it's, it's not what you think is an issue with another person or a group of people is oftentimes not that. It's oftentimes the effect of, of a fallen world, of sin in the world, of different things. And so the way we fight our battles is very different than the way maybe the world would fight their battles. 
So when you have that issue with that person in your workplace or, or your neighbor or whatever, understand that your, your struggle is not always against the flesh and blood person, but it is oftentimes something else. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. There it is again. And after you've done everything to stand. So, so, and was it Peter, or um, earlier, when it, says, when it says, take heed lest you fall, right? If you think you stand, take heed unless you fall. Now, he's saying, when you stand, if you're wearing the armor of God, when you've done everything else, guess what? You're, you're going to find yourself still standing. You know, you check all four legs of the ladder, make sure they're all four down. <laughs> when you get off the ladder, you're still going to be standing. <laughs> and so with the ladder, and that's great. So stand firm then. With the belt of truth. Truth is very important. Very important. It's buckled around your waist. With the breastplate of righteousness in place, which is given to us by Christ. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel, get this, of peace. Gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. Who's your trust in? Who's going to fight for you? Shield keeps you blocked and safe. With that shield, you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. So there's a, there's a protection there. There's all these pieces of the puzzle. Notice that like salvation wasn't the only thing. It wasn't the armor of salvation. It's the whole armor of God. We've talked about that a lot recently, how, how there's so much more to this than just, I'm going to heaven, I'm saved, woo. There's more to it. That's not what it's all about. That's a huge piece. It's hugely important, but, there's, but, the, but it's not the whole thing. That your salvation protects your head in this you know, imagery uh, metaphor here. But what about the rest, right? There's a breastplate of righteousness. There's a belt of truth. There are, there are, there are shoes that are, that are the gospel of peace. This is how we fight our battles. There's even a song like that, I think. So let's back to Exodus, verse 14. We'll finish the chapter out. So the battle's over when, uh, verse 13, Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Verse 14, then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book. Hey, he did. (laughs) And recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Jeez, Amalek done screwed up, guys. I will blot out. When God says he's going to blot out the memory of you from under the heaven, that's not a small thing. That's a big, big screw up. And he, and he wanted Joshua to hear this too. That this, this, is, this is important for Joshua, kind of the next, the next person. Uh, in verse 15, Moses built an altar and called the name of it, The Lord is My Banner. There's your sermon title, sort of. He said, a hand upon the throne of the Lord, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So Moses, after the battle, builds an altar. Now, this is kind of common when you do something great, when you win a battle, you're going to kind of you know, memorialize it some way. You know, we kind of do a similar thing nowadays, but it's more about the people who fought the battle than the actual battle itself, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, and so, so, but this is what they're doing. They're honoring this moment, honoring this time. But rather than saying, you know, hey, Joshua, you won the battle. Great job. Let's erect a monument to Joshua. No, it's, it's a monument to God. They understand. They recognize this, is, this was God's doing. This was God's victory. We could not have done this without God. They don't always recognize that. They don't always remember that. Joshua, after Jericho, loses at AI. But this time, they got it right. They, they make an altar. They call the name of it, the Lord is my banner. And, and, and they're doing this to remember what God has done and to celebrate it. And that, and that phrase, the Lord is my banner. There was an old song, you know, his banner over me is, is a verse, I think, too, it comes with. So, um, you know, again, kind of played out where, where I came from. But to come back to this and kind of think, what does this really mean? What is, what is this? The, the Lord is my banner. I'm going to raise up this banner. So a banner in a military sense, it's a, it's a rallying call. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an identification of a unit or of an army. You know, every different unit has 
uh, their, their marker, and, and it's, hey, it's Veterans Day this weekend, right? So you guys know, some of you know, uh, and it's important. That banner is important. You see it. You, you know it. You recognize it. Those are, those are my guys, those, and, you, and it represents something. It represents everything that, that you fight for, everything that you do for, and it represents also uh, kind of the, 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 what the army is there for, what they do, and the banner is a signal pole around which an army can rally, regroup, or I love this, return for instructions. So when you're fighting the battle and you look back and your banner's way over there, <laughs> I'm not supposed to be fighting over here. I'm going to get back to where my guys are and come back over here. And so, so you return or, or you go out and you've, kinda, you've accomplished this mission or whatever and it's like, okay, I need instruction. I don't know what to do next. Let me find the banner. Let me go back. Let me go back to the banner and return for some instruction. Right? And so when the fight comes, when the enemy attacks, you better raise up the banner, and rally around God. And so, so Moses is saying, the Lord is my banner. The Lord is, is my banner. And, and so when you run back to it, when you go, like battles will come. Battles will come. In John 16, Jesus says, in this world you have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He's, he's given this kind of message to his disciples. We've got a couple minutes. Let's turn there. Don't panic, guys. It won't be long. I was going to read it because there's, so there's so much more in there. But John chapter 16. So right before Jesus is getting um, crucified and betrayed and arrested and all that, he's, he's praying over his disciples and, and, and us, and he's kind of doing all this stuff. And um, He said, I, I, have, I have said these things to you in verse 25. He's talking about your sorrow turning into joy and you will see me for a little while and then I'll be back and just kind of hinting at his resurrection and the Holy Spirit coming and he's, if, he, if he doesn't go to heaven, then, he, then, the, then the Holy Spirit won't be sent. And so it's like, it's kind of part of this thing. He's like, I got to go to heaven. So send the Holy Spirit to you, the comforter, the thing. And, um, and it's just this kind of this crazy moment for the, the disciples. And um, he says, the hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father, and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. And his disciples are like, are you now speaking plainly and not using figurative speech? Because now we know that you know all things, and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. And Jesus says this to them, do you now believe Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Gosh, can you imagine if Jesus said, like, hey, you're all going to leave each other, and, 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 and you're going to leave me? First of all, I'd be like, no. I'd probably be like, Peter, never, uh-uh, not going to happen. I'd probably, I'd probably be that arrogant to say that. And, and Jesus is saying, you, you you're all going to be scattered in your own home. You're going to leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. And then, verse 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, you will have trouble, you have hardship, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus makes no bones about uh, the trials, the struggles, the, the battles that you will fight as a follower of him. He doesn't hide that at all. He's in, in the, in earlier in the chapter, he says, they will hate you it's because you love me, and they hated me, so that's how it's going to go. So, spoiler alert, if you're doing it right, <laughs> some people are probably going to hate you from time to time. That doesn't mean if everybody hates you, then you're doing it right. I'm just saying. You know, like, <laughs> that, that, that's normal to a point. <clears throat> All right, so let's finish up. So... Um, you will have battles, but, but battles are not always a bad thing, okay? Um, in the same way that, that uh, I think it's James says that I rejoice uh, when I suffer. Ha! James, you're funny. <laughs> I rejoice in suffering because I know that suffering breeds character, and character brings perseverance, perseverance, right? So there's a, there's a benefit to it. Battles help us to keep trusting God. They do. If you're not fighting battles... If you've, got, if you've got nothing coming after you, then, then you don't really need God very often, very much. And you kind of can get overconfident in your own abilities, right? It, it happens. It really does. You know, again, this is why you're vulnerable after 
a blessing after a good moment. Israel gets overconfident in their own abilities. We can get to chasing the blessing, the gift, and forget about the giver. So Amalek, I told you, doesn't go away. He sticks around for a long time. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, 1 Samuel 15, there's a prophet named Samuel, and he anoints a king because Israel wants a king, and God's like, you don't want a king. And they're like, we want a king. Everybody has a king. So he's like, all right, I picked Saul to be your king. You're not going to like it, but here he is. And Saul's a good dude at first, but Saul gets a lot of things out of whack. And there's several times when you read this, and he keeps talking to Samuel, and he says, the Lord your God, <laughs> to Samuel. And if you notice, when somebody in Scripture says, the Lord your God, it generally takes that kind of onus off them. It's kind of a sign that, like, okay, this person's not all in. They, they don't quite, you know, get it. They're not quite there. And so what happens is, um, in Exodus, God says, you know, we're going to wipe out Amalek for all time. Like, they're going to be gone. Well, it kind of takes a while <laughs> to eradicate a people that's wicked and evil and whatever. So here in 1 Samuel, like, this is way in the future. Um, Israel has, is settled in the promised land. They have a kingdom. They have a king. Uh, and and um, uh, Samuel tells Saul, that God tells Samuel to tell Saul, he says, it's time um, for you to go and fight and take out Amalek. So what happens is um, the, Lord, the Lord sends Samuel to anoint Saul, king over his people. And he says, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Hey, we just read about that. Verse 3, now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction, which is like a holy term, um, sort of a sacrifice almost, all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. We're going to be done with this once and for all. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them, and 200,000, he goes out, and they go, and they fight, and he sends out the, kind of the good people. He says, you guys go, I don't want to destroy you with them. Uh, he showed kindness to the people of Israel when he came out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and in verse 7, Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. He took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. I wasn't supposed to do that. I was supposed to take them all out. So he's like, well, I'm going to take the king, because that's a trophy. Keeps him alive. He took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Ha! They gave away and destroyed all the stuff that wasn't any good. <laughs> and they kept the best stuff for themselves. Can you, can you smell the arrogance? Right? The overconfidence, missing the point. So the word of the Lord came to Samuel. He said, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me, has not performed my commandments. And so um, for the sake of time, it kind of, this story is very fascinating, but it, it goes on um, and, and Samuel confronts Saul and Saul kind of lies about it. And he's like, well, why do I hear the king? He's like, we killed everybody. He's like, why do I hear the bleeding of sheep and the goats and He's like, I can hear all the livestock back there. He's like, oh, well, we kept, you know, some of it for, like, my guys. And he's like, you weren't supposed to do that. And he's like, why is the king still alive? He's like, well, I thought it would be cool. And so, so then Samuel has to do it himself, right? So he goes and he calls King Agag. And, and, and uh, Agag comes to him kind of, like, um, delightfully, it says. Uh, I don't know if I could find it, but he, he comes to him and he's kind of happy because he thinks like the time of his death has passed. He's like, oh, it's been so long. They won't want to kill me now. And, and Samuel ends up putting to death and kind of finishing the task. And this is when the very next thing that happens is that God tells Samuel to go anoint David as the next king. He says, Saul, Saul screwed up. Saul failed. It's, it's been too much. It's been too long. And so, so he gives the kingship to David. So what happens is if we forget the giver and revere the gifts, we get in a lot of trouble. So you've got to remember to trust the giver, not the gifts. Saul's looking at this and he says, oh, we're supposed to go take out these people? Awesome. By the way, we're going to get all these sheep and goats and everything. We should take all this. This is great. What a gift from God. 
And Saul even says, he even says to Samuel, well, we were, these were sacrifices for God. We, were, we took the best ones. We we're going to sacrifice them to God. And God says, I would so much rather you be obedient than to offer me sacrifices. God, I'm going to give an extra 50 bucks this week because I was bad yesterday. <laughs> like, that's, not, that's not how it works. And this theme pops up in Scripture that God would rather us be obedient than to offer sacrifice. He would rather us just, just do it right the first time than, to, uh, than to, to try and make it right after the fact. And so what happens is Saul has such, such an overconfidence in his own abilities that he starts to trust the gifts. He starts to seek the miracles instead of the miracle maker. He starts to chase what God will do, the blessing rather than who God is. He starts to, to seek the hand of God, what God will give him rather than the face of God the relationship, the importance of, of, of that relationship. So every battle is an opportunity to grow in either faith or doubt. Battles keep us trusting in God. They, they, if, if we're not having battles, then, then we're not seeing how we have to trust in the Lord. They build our faith or they build our doubt. So you can look at your circumstances, you can look at the battles you're facing, you can look at it and you can say, I'll never be rid of this. God, you must not be real. You must not be working in my life. What's the point? This is what it comes down to. When you have a battle, like Israel kind of does this over and over and over again. Every time they have an obstacle, they come to Moses and say, why would you bring us this far to kill us now? Rather than, hey, let's see what God will do for us together. It's always complaining. It's always griping. It's always, you know, just this kind of arrogant bitterness. But instead, you can let your battles build your faith. You say, God, here's an opportunity. I got to trust you with this. You know, even, even, if you, even if you're pretty confident that you can take care of you, you can work it out, still trust him with it. Make sure, make sure you're putting on that armor, you're standing, you're doing everything you can because when you're not careful, that enemy is roaming around like a lion looking to pick you off, right? He's looking to come after you. So you can wonder what's going on, why you're going through this. Say, God must have forgotten. God must not care. Or you can raise up the banner, rally around what you know has carried you in the past, and let your faith be built up through the battle. That's what the raising up the banner means. Raise up that standard. Go back to what he's done. Look at all the altars you've built in your life that say, God did this, God did this, God did this, God did this. God, where are you? That's Israel. Time after time after time after time. So, <laughs> you've got all this faith equity in the bank. Can we use some of it for the moment we're in? Right? That's what it comes down to. Raise the banner of the Lord and gather around it every time it's time to fight. And don't underestimate the faith of other people with you. Joshua and her standing with Moses, that's... That's as important, really, as, as, uh, uh, as what's going on. Aaron and her, I'm sorry. I mean, it's, it's important to be near someone. If you're going through it, you want people around you, agreeing, helping, supporting, and trusting you in the fight, right? And if somebody else you know is going through it, man, be that Aaron. Be that her or him. And, and, and help them out. I had to, guys. I'm sorry. But be there for them. Sometimes it's just as simple as holding their arms up when they're going through it, right? You don't got to say anything. They weren't like, Moses, you should really pray harder. No, just hold your arms up. I mean, we're, we're all either going through it or we know somebody that's going through it, right? There's a place for you in, in that situation. There's a place for you. Let's stand. Let's get out of here. I think you guys got it. Man, love it. Oh, the last blank. Somebody, somebody's going to come after me after church. Raise the banner of the Lord and gather around it every time it's time to fight. I don't know if I said that, but I think you got it anyway. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for today. Thank you for this church, for these people, for a wonderful community of people that we can walk with, that we can do life together, that, that there are so many errands and hers to be with us. You know, when, when we're in the fight, that we know that this is a place where there are people who will hold our arms up. 
And Lord, I pray if somebody's in here feeling alone, I pray that you would touch them, that you would reveal to them, that you would give them that strong of a relationship, that, that, that even today, Lord, somebody might come up and, 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 and meet them and talk to them, and, and, and that new, new relationships would be formed and sparked, new friendships would happen out of that. But God, I, I thank you for um, how faithful you are. That, man, even, even when we are sad or, or, or failures or whatever, like we are in the, when we're in the pit of our battles, Lord, you are so faithful to us. You are so good. And Lord, and Lord I pray that, that anyone who's going through it now, Lord, would, would begin to take up that armor of God. That you would put a helmet of salvation on our heads. You put gospel peace shoes on our feet. That everywhere we walk, we would feel the peace of who you are and what you're doing. That you would tie us with a belt of truth and a breastplate of righteousness. And that our faith would be like a shield in front of us. God, as we walk with you, Lord, we, we know that we see in part at this time. But eventually we'll see in full. So, so, so God, as we trust, as we walk, I pray that you would be so near. That you would, we would look back over, over 5, 10, 20, 40 years and see the, the altars that we have built to you. The moments where you broke in and, and you brought a victory in a battle that we had no business winning. Lord, I pray that that would just spur us toward greater faith. And that anyone who might be wondering where you are right now, that you would be just close to them in this moment. Just do what only you can do, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.